Okay, welcome everyone to the Applied Topology Network seminar. Uh, so the speaker today is Louis Mead, and he's going to tell us um, from large to infinite random simplicial complexes. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, of course, to the organizers for letting me speak, and of course for organizing the this COVID collection of seminars. Um, so yeah, from large to infinite random simplicial complexes, I'll put a little asterisk against infinite in case time permitting, we don't get to it, but hopefully we do and we should do. So firstly, what's a simplicial complex? Um, obviously preaching to the choir with um, an applied topology group, but for me, it's going to be a subset of a power set of a set of vertices. So I, uh, we have a vertex set one to N and our simplicial complex is a set of subsets of this set of vertices and it satisfies downward closure, downward closed. So I, if sigma is in X and tau is a subset of sigma, then sigma, uh, then tau is in X. Oh, so I assume we're probably pretty happy with what a simplicial complex is. And um, what's everyone's favorite simplicial complex? It's obviously the graph. So for me, a graph is going to always be a one-dimensional simplicial complex. So I.e. we have G is equal to VE, V is some vertex set, and E is a collection of pairs of those vertices. So we're going to get to random simplicial complexes. So to start with, let's, as always, do the baby case. Let's do random graphs and um, graphs. So for me, everything throughout is going to be abstract. So there's no geometry going on. It's always going to be, I have an underlying set of vertices and then taking things from this underlying set of vertices. Uh, so random graphs were done first in 59, I want to say, uh, by Gilbert and obviously Erdo Schreni. So what are they? I have a set of vertices. And for me, it's going to be a set one to n. And then with probability p, I select independently at random every possible edge. edge. Okay, so we have G in GNP, a random graph. Um, what sort of questions do you want to answer? So now obviously any combinatorial or graph theory question you could ask about G is now a probabilistic question. So graph theory goes to probability. So e.g. No, you no longer have is G connected or is G um, acyclic. You'd have what's the probability G is connected given the parameters. Okay, and in general, what sort of results do we actually look for? We don't really look for just what's the probability this happens. We tend to ask, given these parameters, what happens as N gets very, very big? So typically, what happens as n goes to infinity? So the kind of seminal result that I'll continually talk about generalizing is this for connectivity. So connectivity, random graph. And um, what does this say? So this says if G is in GNP and P is equal to one minus epsilon log N over N, then the probability G is connected tends to zero. And if P is one plus epsilon log n over n, then the probability 
g is connected tends to one. Okay, so we have this, so this, this is called a threshold function. So in this case, we'd say that log n over n is the threshold for connectivity. So it's not necessarily true that in general for any property you would want that there is definitely this one function where if you're below it, it doesn't happen. And if you're above it, it does happen. Um, if it's a simple property, so if it's a first order property, whatever that means, then that, it, that will be the case. But in general, most properties aren't first order. And so you can't necessarily expect this threshold behavior. But a lot of the time we do get these quite nice, satisfying sort of dichotomies. Uh, yep. Can I ask a question? What's an example of, of something that's uh, not a threshold uh, property or not a first order property? So, we, so connectivity is not a first order property, but it does have this threshold. I see. We will see in a random simplicial complex where we don't have a threshold. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, in five or 10 minutes, we'll see. So we've done random graphs. How do we generalize to random simplicial complexes? So there was two done at roughly the same time in the sort of early 2000s um, to mid 2000s. So the first was by Lineal, Meshulam, and Meshulam. Wow. So what happens here? So if we think about a random graph, what happened? We had all vertices and we added edges at random. So as a person who studies the simplicial complexes, I would say that we had the full zero skeleton and we added one dimensional simplices at random. So for linear Meshulam, for random complex in YKNP, what do we have? We have the full k skeleton, uh, k minus one skeleton, sorry. And add independently at random k phases, k simplices with probability e. So we have, in the case of Y2NP, we contain the full, um, the full graph, the full underlying one skeleton, for sure. And then we add in independently at random the, the, the triples. And note that if K is equal to one, this is the GMP. So this was done for K is two by linear Meshulam and for larger K and Meshulam and Wallach. And there was also the clique complexes, random clique complexes. Of McHale. So what's a clique complex? So given a graph, given a graph G, um, the clique complex is the simplicial complex obtained by fill all cliques in G. So for example, if we have this graph, and then we clique it, what do we do? So, the, so we don't have a clique on the, these four vertices, so that will stay the same, but we do have a, have a complete graph on two, four, five. So the clique complex will be this same graph with a one, two simplex. Okay, so we take all uh, induced sub uh, complete subgraphs and we add a add a n minus one dimensional simplex to that so how do we get random clique complexes well we know how to get a simplicial complex from a graph so to get random clique complexes 
we take the random graph and we clique it. So I'll denote this by XMP. So we, we generate a random graph and then fill it up as much as we can with simplices. So now what sort of results do we want to look for here? It's also similarly going to be thresholds. So can we, given some probability parameter, does something happen or not happen? And what's the topologist's favorite generalization of connectivity? It's obviously the vanishing of homology groups. So there are such generalizations. So again, Lin mesh, mesh. Um, so their, their result says if we have a k dimensional random simplicial complex, and if p is equal to k minus epsilon log n over n, then the probability that h k minus one of y is equal to zero. So to be true, we'll put it has to have um, finite characteristics uh, field. Uh, character, uh, sorry, yeah, let's just do F2. The probability that the k minus one dimensional homology vanishes tends to zero. And if P is k plus epsilon log n over n, then the same thing now tends to one. So this is still a threshold. Uh, do I mean this? I think I mean probability. No, no, it's right. So when we're below this threshold, it, the homology definitely doesn't vanish. So there are some k minus one dimensional cycles. And note that we couldn't have any k minus two or lower dimensional cycles because we contain the full k minus one dimensional skeleton. And then as we transition through k log n over n, we suddenly go from having some cycles to having nothing. Uh, so this is still a threshold, but in the case of clique complexes, that dependence on k is really pretty. So in the in, in the connect in the connected case, k was just one because you were looking at zero dimensional homology. Is that exactly, it? exactly, yeah. So yeah. that's there, there's not actually k doesn't have such an impact that you might expect. You know, even though there's obviously n n choose k plus one possible k simplices to add, it you only get this extra factor of k in this threshold, which is yeah very pretty. And also I should note that there are, there are known thresholds for vanishing of the first homotopy group. And I think also now, um, I think it's also been shown that if we have integer coefficients, this threshold is still the same, but don't quote me on that. Um, the theorem of Kale for clique complexes. So what does it say? So we have X is in X N P and p is n to the minus alpha for alpha just some non-negative real now the depend now how al alpha passes through different regimes we get different characteristics so if alpha is bigger than k 1 over k or alpha is less than 1 over 2k plus 1 then the probability that h uh, hk x with integer coefficients is zero tends to one. So if I've, I've done this the opposite way around, but who cares? And if one over k plus one is less than alpha is less than one over k, then the probability hk x integer is zero tends to zero. So let's do a little number line picture. So if we have one over two K plus one, one over K plus one, and one over K. So if alpha is here, then we have that it's equal to, it vanishes. So there's no, no homology. If we're in here, it's non-zero. 
and if we're here it's zero but there's this kind of missing missing segment and in fact it's since been shown that stuff can actually happen in this missing segment so we don't actually get this sharp threshold as we pass between uh, as we go below one over k plus one we don't all of a sudden immediately get homological connectivity so in here this is um, with probability one so all of these things are obviously with probability conversion to one in here we have very different things can happen we can't say definitely something does or doesn't happen so there is this kind of this little regime where we're not not we don't have such tight control over what happens also note that the clique complex the dimension of the clique complex is in general unbounded for the uh Mishulam Walla, if the dimension is either k minus one in a in a very unlikely case or it's k in the uh clique complex it's the dimension is the size of the largest clique minus one and so i mean if you took p is equal to one then you have the full graph and so you would have the full simplex and so the dimension there is n minus one so there there's kind of quite a difference between these these two and also because of kind of because of this we can have non-vanishing homology in every dimension possible it's no longer there's just one interesting dimension of homology you can have homology from zero up to potentially n okay and so both of these depend on question what yep are there, are there any results on the cohomology groups or is this just all for homology oh uh, so i mean uh, so these are actually proven for for cohomology so okay. it, at least at least for the machine model it's the proof is all done with with co-cycles okay uh yeah and then and then you use universal coefficient theorem to actually get to homology so yeah okay. somehow it's more natural to think about cohomology and in the in the re regime between one over two k plus one and one over k plus one does it make sense to to ask you know is the probability that homology is non-zero converging to one half or, or something like this i mean not prove it but even to ask those questions does that make so sense? I think there's a uh, I think there's a conjecture that it should be a bouquet of spheres in this case, but I don't actually know. Uh, I, so I'd, I'd be surprised if it would converge to one to a half. Um, obviously, because a half is in between. Yeah, but one, like some some sense. function, some function uh, going from zero to to one, I guess. So yeah, I suspect it would be, but yeah, I don't actually know. Thanks. So yeah, I, I don't think it would be a half. I think yeah, it's much more likely they would be a function actually sort of in, interpolating from zero to one. Okay, and then, so what did both of these models have in common? So there's kind of only um, one parameter of randomness. So for, uh, linear Mishulam, it's just in the case dimension we pick at random and then for the clique complexes it's in dimension one and then we get randomness in other dimensions but it's all generated from that first dimension so now i'll give a model which was initially called the multi-parameter random superficial complex so this was by uh, Costa and Faber in 12, 13. So what happens now? So now we have randomness in all dimensions. So randomness in all dimensions. So we're gonna have P0, P1, P2 to P n minus one. And I'll say why is in y n p where p is the vector of probabilities and how do we do it so we build upwards so first we select 
vertices at random, at random, with probability P0. So now we have a random vertex set, and then from this random vertex set, we add edges with probability P1. Now we have a random graph, so we can fill in some, uh, fill in triangles in this random graph, fill in triangles in random graph with probability P2, and then fill in, so if we have the boundary of a simplex, fill sigma with probability P, dimension of sigma. Okay, so what happens, so let's do a very small example. We select vertices. And let's yeah, label them one, three, five, six, eight, nine. So this is the first step we select vertices, then we add edges. So I can change color, I think. Then we add some edges. And let's do this one. So now we've added, added edges at the next stage from what we have. Now from the possible triangles we have, we can fill them in. So even if we were to select 159, we can't include it because the boundary of the simplex isn't there, but we could add, say, 135. And so now we have the, this multi-level of randomness. We build on top of each other at each level. So the question now is what type of um, results would one want in this case, especially if we're looking for thresholds. So what would it mean? So if we look back to random graph, uh, random graph, a kind of crude way of saying the connectivity would be if we have P is n to the minus alpha, G in G n P. If alpha is less than one, then G is connected with probability 10 to one. And if alpha is bigger than one, then G is not. So we have this threshold at precisely at one. So as alpha is less than it, we have something. If alpha is more than it, we have something. And then right at that threshold, we're not too sure exactly what's going to be happening. So that's what is generalized. So we say the theorem is cost of harbor. So we have y is in y um, mp, where pi equals n to the minus alpha i for all, uh, and then for any i bigger than some dimension, the probability is zero. So this just this guarantees that the complex is finite dimensional. So we have this randomness now just depends on this um, vector of probabilities alpha. And we suspect that dependent on where alpha lies, we should have various things happen. And that's what we do. So there exists um, domains, D minus one, D zero, D R, such that um, they're disjoint. And, <clears throat> Uh, in between any two, so between di and di plus one, is a hyperplane of dimension, of co-dimension one. So I'll relate this back, so in a minute. And then what, what does this mean? So then if alpha is in one of these dk's, so we know it's only in one, then we know what happens homologically. So then the probability that the 
IF homology vanishes tends to one for any I less than K. So if we're below this K, then we have no rational homology. And if we're and in dimension K, it dominates. So by dominates, what do I mean? I mean that the, the rank of HK is much bigger than the rank of any other. So obviously the, the rank of those for I less than K is zero. If what this says is that for if we're less than K, we have no homology. In K, we have big homology. Above K, we can have some but not too much. Okay, so what, how do we relate this back to, back to a graph? So for a graph, what do we have? We had that R is equal to one. So it's at most one dimensional. We had alpha zero is just zero. We want all of the vertices. And then we have that precisely as we cross over this, zero dimensional hyperplane, we have connectivity or non-connectivity. So as we traverse through these, these domains, there's so, the area in between we, you don't understand, but either side, you know exactly this definitely happens or this definitely doesn't happen. But in between, it could maybe happen, maybe not happen. And also it's a hyperplane, so there's kind of an infinite number of values that it can take, but it's code dimension one. Okay, so this, this is model of Costa and Faber. And also note it generalizes both that of um, Matt Kale and Linear Mishulam. If you take P zero equals and, and Lewis, those, uh, those DI regions cover the space of possible parameters. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So <clears throat> the union of the DIs uh -huh. is R, R plus one, greater than or equal zero, minus the union of these hyperplanes. Thanks. So that, because we know that these hyperplanes are the kind of boundaries. But so yeah, in some senses, you know, measure zero that we don't understand, but cool. yeah. Yeah, and so if we have P0 up to PK minus 1 is 1, and PK is P, and P um, I0 for I bigger than K, this is uh, Lin Mesh, voila. And if we have P0 is 1, P1 is P, and PI is 1 for all I not equal to 1, this is clique complexes. So this generalizes both of the both of the form formal models. Now I want to talk find about some of my own work, which also is multi-parameter. So this is joint with Michael and Tarnovic. This is also multi parameter. So, before, what do we do? We built from, we selected zero simplices, and then from this, we added one simplices, and from that, we filled in triangles to get two simplices. Now we go from top down. So, we um, start at level. R, and we include all R simplices independently with probability PR. So we include the R simplex and subfaces because we want a simplicial complex. So I look at all R plus one tuples from a set of size N and I say, do I want to include this or do I not? And then we go to level R minus one. 
And now from, so now some R minus one simplices will already be, have been selected. So from the non-selected R minus one simplices include them independently with prob P R minus one. And then you do this all the way down, down to vertices. Yep, so we start by, um, say we have one, two, three, four, five. I have R is equal to, say two, so we're not trying to draw too big. And then I select one, two, three, and two, four, five. So this is at the, the first stage. And then at the second stage, from those edges that aren't already included, I now include them with, with probability P1 to say we'll have the same thing as before. And now we can have some other edges. So let's say this edge gets added and this edge gets added. And then at the final stage, to so say if our initial set was actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at the final stage, now we can add in vertices that haven't already been selected. Yep, so we, we start at the top, add our top dimensional simplices, then look at co-dimension one that haven't already been included and go down, down, down. So we call this the upper model. for random simplicial complexes because we start from the up and we call the, the previous one the lower model, um, Father Costa lower model. And so the notation we use is Y N P lower and Y N P upper. So lower for lower, upper for upper. And uh, the, the way we initially studied them was actually viewing them both as, a, as being realized from random hypergraphs. So if you have a hypergraph, you can get a simplicial complex in two possible ways or two kind of natural ways. You either look at the biggest simplicial complex contained in that hypergraph, or you look at the smallest one that contains it. And because we looked at it in this way, it felt natural that there should be some sort of relation between these two models. And there was, um, so model relation comes from duality, Alexander duality. So the, the hope obviously is you have some relation between the two and then so you can get some sort of information for free in one model from the other one. And we actually hope that by studying the upper, maybe we can know more about the lower. Um, what's Alexander duality? So what's the Alexander dual? So given a simplicial complex X and a vertex set on a vertex set, V, the Alexander dual or combinatorial Alexander dual is defined, so has vertices the same set. And we have sigma is in X hat if and only if the simplex on the complementary simplices, on the complementary vertices, so the simplex on here is not included in your original complex. So I prepared an example because I tried to do an example on the fly before and it went wrong. If we take um, X as the 
the following. And then we want to look at the dual. So we have the same vertex set. And then when do I have an edge? If and only if the complement, uh, so I, I should also say that the dimension of X is less than or equal to V minus two. Uh, so it, so it, obviously in general, it could be the full simplex. In this case, we're restricting to the boundary of the full simplex at most. Uh, so we take X hat, when do we have an edge? Do we have this edge? No, because the complementary vertices are this, and we do have those, the, uh, that edge. Do we have this edge? Ye no, because the complementary is, uh, do we have this edge? Let's see. So the complementary is this, so no, we don't. What edge do we have? We have just this one, because, it, it, the underlying graph of X is the complete graph minus this edge. So the only possible edge we can have is the one that is dual to that. So we have this. So why would someone want to study uh, Alexander dual? Because as is kind of indicated, you get a duality on homology. So Alexander duality. So this says that if we take, if I want the cave homology of the dual with any coefficients, then this is isomorphic to the n minus k minus three of the original. So this is where x is on n vertices. And so where does this come from? So normal uh, Alexander duality says that if you uh, if you take the normal Alexander dual, that this is homotopy equivalent to the complement in a sphere of the appropriate dimension. And this is precisely what we are doing, but in a kind of simplicial version, we take the, the, the X hat we define here is the geometric realization of it is um, homotopy equivalent to the geometric realization of SN minus X. So this is where it comes from. And so we do get this nice relation on um, between the dual and the original complex. And we also managed to show that the um, two models that I described are dual to each other. So model duality. So if Y is in Y n lower P, then Y hat is in Y upper oh, upper N P prime where P I prime is equal to one minus the complementary, so N minus I minus two. And so this almost exactly immediately comes from just the definition. I, when, when do I have a simplex in my dual, if and only if I don't have the, the simplex in the original and kind of just a dimension argument gives you this n minus i minus two. So the hope was combining this, um, combining this and the uh, Alexander duality, can we get info for free about upper and fortunately for being able to write a paper but unfortunately for having easy information you kind of in general don't so why not uh, so in general for kind of all probabilistic um, disc discrete probabilistic structures, you look at when the probability parameters tend to zero, as n goes to infinity, in, and then what happens here, so you can say, if we had some statement saying about in the lower model, something happens as the probability parameters go to zero, that corresponds to the complementary pro probability parameters going to one, which is kind of not particularly natural to think about. And the second issue, so no, 
and no squared. So why, why else? Because we get a dimension flip. So in the original, we, so most results about uh, these lower model ransom simplicial complexes have a fixed, fixed max dimension R. So what does that mean? That means that I have no simplices of dimension R plus one so in the dual, I have all possible simplices of dimension Rn minus R minus one minus one. So we get if um, Y has fixed dimension, then Y hat contains the full a giant skeleton, which is also kind of insane to, just very unnatural to ever think about this. Um, this model, why would you ever kind of look at this kind of small co-dimension rate range with probability parameters 10 into one? So we wasn't able to just get information for free. Um, I, will, I won't state what we did do, but I'll just hint at it that we had similar um, domain type results for upper model, um, but quite a bit weaker. So this is me, Michael, and Novik. And so why were they weaker? Essentially because for two reasons that um, links behave well in the lower model whatever that means, kind of taking a skeleton is well behaved in the lower model because you build from the bottom up. Whereas here it's tough to understand what's happening in the, in the cave dimension because it can be influenced by the K plus one, the K plus two dimension. And also we didn't have um, a unimodal largest number of faces in some dimension, but yeah, whatever. We had, so we had some similar results, but weaker. Um, in the last couple of weeks, there seems to have been some results on the homology of the upper model by Cooley, Hang, et al. But I've not probably read this in detail, so I thought I wouldn't include, include their statements here. So after we conclude this project, we thought um, the duality relation we have between these two models seems pretty nice. When can we actually use it? And when can we use it is precisely when we don't, it doesn't matter that probability parameters, so we don't want probability parameters going to zero or going to one, and we don't want to have a fixed maximal dimension. And so that led to uh, the medial regime, uh, not after my surname, but I'll include it because I'm the one giving the talk. Um, the medial regime, so what is it? So uh, a random upper or lower simplicial complex is medial if all the parameters are universally bounded essentially. So if there exists a P in zero one such that um, P is less than or equal to PI less than or equal to one minus P for all I. So you could the, the simple case of take every probability parameter equal to a half, this is trivially medial. Yep. And so now what will happen when we do the duality? So duality. Well, we had that this pi prime was one minus p n minus i minus two. And now, so these PI primes are still going to be bounded above and below by the same things for any I. So we don't get that we have this uh, issue of probability parameters going to zero, then the complementary go to one, because none of them go to zero and none of them go to one. And we also don't have any bounding on dimension, right? We, uh, because we say that all the probability parameters for all I are bounded above and below. So in general, the dimension is unbounded. So D 
dimension is unbounded, but how unbounded? And so that was our first result, which says uh, that the dimension is actually very, very, so even for a lot, so if Y is lower model, medial, then with probability conversion to one, we have that the dimension is very, very close. So it's bounded above by log two, log n, plus triple log, log two, log two, log n, plus some constant that depends on the, probability, the bounding probability and bounded below by the same thing. Log, log, and minus c. Okay, so not the, the prettiest expression, but then also for me, kind of crazy that um, the dimension of this complex it does definitely it diverges as n goes to infinity, but it very, very slowly. And moreover, you can very, very precisely say that the dimension up to a constant is exactly this: this double log plus triple log. So it goes to infinity, but and the dimension goes to infinity, but very slowly. We also had that the homology with rational coefficients is zero for zero, or the, let's do the reduced i less than or equal to log two, log two, uh, log two, log n minus c. So if we're below double log, then we have no homology. But then what happens in between? Um, double and triple log. So we have this kind of small but uh, diverging range where we could potentially have non-trivial homology. Um, so I can say that in the easy case, so if the pi is a half for all i, then uh, the first homology above this range doesn't vanish. So then H, K, Y for I equals this log two log N plus one uh, for K equals. So we have this one, so it's kind of homologically trivial, 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 and then potentially non-trivial and so in, in a simple case, it is non-trivial, but in general, it's not clear. Um, and what do we get for free? So I won't write the results because I'm running out of time and I'd like to say something about infinite complexes. But what do we get for free? So we know that the dual complex is gonna be upper medial. It's gonna contain a gigantic skeleton because it's gonna contain a skeleton of dimension this n minus this minus two or three so it has a huge huge skeleton and then some randomness going on at the top we know that the homology will vanish all but for this for a triple log range and the dimension of it is also going to be with probability one n minus one so it's there so here are these two extremes and duality actually works very nicely. Let's very quickly talk about infinite. So complexes. So first we'll talk about infinite graphs. So the radio graph. So before we was doing GNP, now I'm gonna do G naturals P. So same definition, except now we have all possible uh, natural numbers and we have an edge between any two of them with probability P. So for any, so there, there exists a graph R deterministic such that the probability any G in G N P for any P in zero one 
uh, such that the probability that G is isomorphic to R equals one. So I don't know if, it, if this sounds surprising or not, is to me, this says that we start with any randomness we want. And I know for sure that actually it's not random, it's just this, this determined graph. Um, moreover, this graph has uh, kind of interesting properties. It's universal. So that means that any subgraph, any graph finite or countable can be embedded as an induced subgraph. It's homogeneous. So that means that any partial isomorphism can be extended to a full isomorphism. So if I'm at one vertex to another vertex, that's a partial isomorphism. I can find a full graph isomorphism that maps that vertex to that vertex. And it's also the unique such graph. So if I take any two graphs with this universal and homogeneous property, then it is the radio graph. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do for random simplicial complexes. So this is, again, Mr. Michael, myself, and Lewin Strauss. And we say for any um, X in, uh, let's do for any Y in Y naturals P, where these P are medial regime. So they're all uniformly bounded above and below by something. So for any, any of this, um, so there exists a complex X such that for any random, any random simplicial complex, the probability Y is isomorphic to X is equal to one. Um, and moreover, what does this complex have? It's universal. So any finite or countable simplicial complex can be embedded as an induced subcomplex. It's homogeneous. Every partial isomorphism of the complex, so every mapping from the vertices to the vertices, can be extended to a full isomorphism. Um, and very kind of surprising for me is it's contractible. And in fact, it's a um, triangulation of the infinite simplex. And again, it's unique. So any, any simplicial complex that has these two properties is, it, it, it are the same up to isomorphism. So I will finish there. I rushed through the bit at the end, but I wanted to say infinite, so apologies. Okay, questions? I have a, oh, it looks like there's a question in the... Oh yeah, I see. Uh, so uh, there is a question in the chat window. I normally think of the canonical ASC derived from a hypergraph as the one formed by closing the AG by subset. Can you give an example of the other one? Um, so I'm not entirely sure I answer the question, but I think you're saying, we, so we have a hypergraph. So for me, this is a set of subsets of one to n or whatever. So there's no downward close. And then I have two maps. I'll call mu lower and mu upper to simplicial complexes. How are they defined? So mu lower of x is the largest complex already in x. So the largest kind of amount of sets that are contained in X that are already downward closed. And mu upper is the smallest containing X. So for example, if we had one, two, three, um, one, two, suppose this was our hypergraph, then mu lower would just give us this and the upper would give us the simplex. I'm uh, sorry if that, uh, that wasn't actually what you was asking, but. Uh, so the response is, ah, yes, thanks. So. Okay, 
Okay, it's hopefully fun. it was then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This, right. this, hi, this is Ira, I have a question. Back hi, to the Ira. beginning of the talk, hi, with your bound, um, log n over n, that's sort of the inverse of the prime number theorem. What's the relationship? Is there, it seems too coincidental. I, I don't know, that it, it, it is interesting. Maybe also just because um, numbers are somehow behave randomly. I don't know, I think that's a very weak answer. Yeah, so the, the log n over n comes out of um, when do you not have an isolated vertex? So that's precisely the time when you, so if you're below that, you do have an isolated vertex. If you're above it, you don't. Yeah. So that's where, where the log n over n comes from for that. But I, with primes, I don't, I don't know. All right, I'll think about it. Thank you. No worries. Okay, so then we have uh, another question, namely, could you give more insight about a homogeneity property? Yep, so homogeneity says, so, if I, so first of all, what, what does it mean to, to have a partial isomorphism? What's an isomorphism of a graph or a simplicial complex? It's a mapping, uh, so we have an isomorphism from X to Y is, a bijective map from the vertices of X, to the vertices of Y, such that if we have a, if we have a simplex on the left, so let's do X zero to X n is in X if and only if the image. So let's call this map fire. is in Y. So that's what an isomorphism is. I map, map vertices to vertices and then that precisely maps simplices to simplices. So homogeneity says any partial isomorphism extends to a full ISO. So IE I ha if I have a map from U to V, that's uh, isomorphism on the on the subgraphs or the subcomplexes, then there exists phi capital that when we restrict to U is the 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 partial, and phi capital is an iso. So it's really very strong, right? Any, anything that I can do on some sort of small scale, so I have some local similarity that can actually extend to a global symmetry. Okay. Um, so then we have another question in the chat window. Does this work with random simplicial complex? Uh, does this work with random simplicial complexes uh, translate well into random cubical complexes? If so, has there been much work done investigating random cubical complexes? In this so yeah, cubical complexes have been studied, and I think that I can't remember any names right now. But so where where would the differences come from? So obviously to have a K cycle in a cubical complex versus a K cycle in a simplicial complex, you need different numbers of, of faces, faces and different kind of connections between them. So you wouldn't expect precisely the parameters in one will directly relate to the other. Um, and in fact, it's kind of going to be almost more like, uh, less likely to have a cycle for the same parameter in cubicle because you kind of need more faces joining in a specific way. Uh, but there, there definitely has been work work done on it, but names I don't know. But if you Googled cubicle random random complexes, you'd get something. Okay, so now just for the sake of time, so that we don't lose too many participants, I would ask, uh, I would, would like to uh, thank again Lewis for his talk. Um, and I would um, ask uh, the audience to unmute yourself so that we can call for the speaker. Um, so um, feel free to ask questions, but I will finish the recording any minute now. So like all the questions after um, after this other debate will be offline. Um, the only thing I want to point out is that uh, so during uh, like because of all the lockdowns and because of all the conference cancellations, uh, we do um, have a seminar uh, on Mondays as well. 
uh, in addition to Wednesday. So the next time we meet will be on Monday. Uh, and it's a subset of talk from the ATMCS series. So one of the uh, main uh, applied topology conferences. So um, we hope to see you again on Monday. Uh, and um, thank you again, Louis. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. <clears throat> I think Alex might have had a question. I don't know if Alex is. Yeah, so feel free. So I just stopped the recording. Uh, feel free to continue asking questions now. I, I now have two questions, which is, is the talk on Monday on the AATRN Google Calendar? Or will it, it be? I, th I think it is. I'll double check. And if not, I'll fix it. So we'll follow up, say, up yeah, on I, that I, offline. I, I cannot answer that. So hopefully the second one is is more in my my realm. Yes. Um, so Lewis, I have to apologize because I joined the talk late. So I I joined right. right when you started to describing the upper and lower complexes. Yep. Which, as I understood it, you you start with you you pick your top level simplices, then you pick the next level that are not already there, and so on. Right. Uh, yeah. That's so the that, that's the that's the upper. Yeah. Exactly. And then lower would be the other. Okay. So exactly, yeah. I had a question that was not super specific yet, but um, if if I handed you, it's sort of it's sort of the 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 inference problem or the the if I handed you a bunch of samples, I said yeah. here's a bunch of simple simplicial complexes generated according to this process. Could you Can tell I, me the parameters? Yeah. Uh, I think I could tell you if it's not the parameters, right? So possibly. So in in terms of you could sort of do some sort of like no null hypothesis of you know the, the probability vector is this or versus not, and then look at some of some results that are, that we have on. So there there are kind of quantitative results of like the the probability that the homology vanishes. It's the probability vanishes, but with what rate? Mm -hmm. And you could maybe use that to say, oh, well, the, the Betty numbers of, of this complex or some of the Betty numbers of this complex don't fall in that regime. But of, uh, of course, to be able to say that something actually is a simplish, it is the simplest complex you're talking about, you need something stronger than just the, um, to know what the Betty numbers are. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it could be used to kind of rule, it could maybe used to say that, oh, it's not random. The, the, the data you're, you're, you're rising from, it's not one of these two models of random complexes, but being able to say mm -hmm. that it is not so much, I don't think at the moment. Okay. I think, um, sorry, I just thought of another related to this. Yeah. If I, if I handed you, and I, I, I really will want to hunt down these papers because this is, this is just related to the kinds of questions I'm looking at right now. I, if you, sorry. Uh, you're, you're welcome to send me an email and I'll send you a relevant, um, yeah, relevant backlog. Awesome. I, I definitely will. Um, my other, I guess my other question is if I handed you a hypergraph yep. that's generated according to some process, yep. the, if the process of generating the hypergraph is more or less dimension K clicks, you know, the, the, the subsets of dimension K uh -huh. show up with a certain probability and you have P1, P2, P, P0 through PK or whatever. Um, could you infer something by computing the upper and lower complexes of that graph or from lots of samples of those things? Maybe yeah, that's so the question I had in mind. Possibly. So it depends how, um, like if, so if you have a K, a K, K, plus, a K uniform um, edge in your hypergraph, is that something where they're truly lower dimensional things don't matter at all or not? Right. Because if the lower dimensional things don't matter, then I don't know how you can, why you would look at simplicial complexes, right? Other than maybe just to have some other numbers that you can pump out of a computer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if, if somehow like you do only measure these kind of K-wise interactions, but you know that, that, that there is this kind of lower, lower level stuff as well, then, I mean, that's naturally going to be like this upper model thing because you kind of only measure the, the, this K-set you know that they're all subsets kind of do interact, but you don't measure that, then that's kind of almost, even though it's represented as a hypergraph, it is kind of this upper model simplicial complex. Mm -hmm. right. Thanks. No worries. And Alex, just to respond to your first question. So we have two different Google calendars, one for the Wednesday seminar and one for the Monday. Um, so the Monday Google calendar is linked from the webpage that I just put in the chat. Um, and it has awesome. next Monday's talk on it. Yeah.